you do sports betting, it's gonna take away money from other forms of gambling. So do not expect that you are gonna generate, keep generating revenues for other forms of gambling and the new league. Despite the uh, legalization of different types of gambling activities, there hasn't been much growth in revenues. But spending on education grows much faster than revenues generated from lottery. So in other words, uh, states um, that are relying on lottery revenues to fund education, they end up having much less revenues to fund the education over time. Despite <laughs> so much noise around lottery, the revenues are not so significant. of commercialized gambling on state budgets. And we are very blessed today to have the, the person who I think is the, the best independent expert of government revenues on most of the, these, not just, they call them sin taxes sometimes, whatever they call but just on taxes from things like tobacco and, and, and gambling and so on. Like, to me, she's the most prolific expert in the country on this, and it's Dr. Lucy Dedean. She's the principal research associate, associate with the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center at the Urban Institute, and, it's, and, it's that, it's, and that's where she leads the state tax and economic review project. And I've really had a distinction of, of reading Lucy's work for probably over 15 years uh, now, and there's no one that has influenced me more in terms of really tough, revealing the truth about this, the issue of gambling as a revenue source. So with that, I would love to introduce Lucy, welcome to joining us today. Thanks. Thank you so much. Can can you all hear me well? Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, uh, thank you so much, Les. Thank you for uh, supporting my work and for inviting me today to present our work, our research on gambling tax revenues. So just. To give you two things, uh, first disclaimer, um, um, recommendations and data analysis presented today is my views and do not represent Urban Institute's view, although I don't think they are going to be very different. And second thing is to give you a little bit of history, uh, how I came to study revenues from gambling. So I am a researcher and my focus of research is studying state revenues. And back in 2008, during the Great Recession, there was this wave of uh, states uh, legalizing commercial casinos. And my boss asked me, how much money do casinos um, generate, why are the states so much eager to legalize uh, commercial casinos? So I went back to see if there is any data and to my surprise I couldn't find any all state uh, data on how much revenues do states uh, generate from commercial casinos. So I started collecting data on my own from each state individually and that's how I started uh, getting interested in gambling tax revenues and over the years I have written several reports. So let's go into the presentation. I think we should look back to the gambling history very briefly to understand um, um, the history to know uh, where we are headed to. And gambling has a very long history in the United States. I mean, it's a one thing that it wasn't legalized in uh, before 20th century, but um, it was only in the early 20th century that uh, the states have started legalizing gambling. Why? In response to the Great Depression, because states were um, suffering economically and they needed to generate more revenue so 
they legalize, uh, they legalize uh, different forms of uh, gambling and mostly party mutual at the time in response to the Great, Recession, uh, Great Depression. So Kentucky was your first state to formally legalize party mutual betting in 1906. You all know Nevada was the first state to legalize commercial casinos in 1931. And New Hampshire was the first state to legalize modern day lotteries in 1964. Now, let's take a look at the legalization timeline for perimutual betting, lotteries, casinos, and racinos. Uh, in here, uh, the gray shaded bars are recession years. So, for the I didn't uh, put the early recessions, just 70s and forward. Um, and it stops at 2020. I didn't put the 2020 recession either in here. So the um, blue dots are the number of states that have been legalizing perimutual um, um, over the time. So you can see that in 1906 was Kentucky and the number of states grew and you see that it usually grows around the uh, recession years. And when uh, you have the red dots, which are for lottery, uh, started in 1964, it increased. Uh, nowadays, there are 45 states that have lottery. And the same thing goes for commercial casinos from 1931, Nevada, all the way to uh, 70 something, 74, I believe when New Jersey legalized and when the number of states just increased. So why do states legalize and expand gambling? Well, the first reason is to raise revenue in response to state fiscal conditions. Lottery legalization was in response to 1973 and 1980s double dip recessions. Whereas uh, casinos uh, came to uh, skyrocketed in um, response to 2001, uh, 1991, 2001, and, uh, and the Great Recession. So the argument is that they stimulate economic development and they can counteract uh, interstate competition for gambling revenue. Another argument is they, they, that they attract tourism and keep gambling residents and tax sellers in state. But all of these arguments are really for more like political gimmicks rather than uh, reality. And I will show you with the numbers. So despite the uh, legalization of commercial casinos in so many states, and uh, as of now, at least two dozen of states, I, I believe uh, the latest number is 25, 26 states, have uh, commercialized co uh, casinos, state uh, uh, commercialized casinos. Despite the com uh, legalization of casinos, lotteries still played the biggest uh, role in the gambling revenue. So about two thirds of the all revenue is coming from lottery and Casinos generate only about one third of the revenues. Video games is the uh, light blue slice, and you can see that Perry Mutuals once they were generating so much revenue, and now they do not. Why? Because there is always a substitution for gambling activities. If you are gonna introduce sports betting, it's gonna take away money from other forms of gambling. So do not expect that you are gonna generate keep generating revenues for other forms of gambling and the newly um, enacted type of gambling activity. Now, the following figure shows the gambling revenues for different types of gambling over time from fiscal year 2008 to fiscal year 2019. I stop in fiscal year 2019 because as you all know, 2020 was not a normal year because of the pandemic. Many uh, casinos were closed, were shut down. So I didn't want to distort the numbers to, uh, to show drop and then a, a strong growth the next year. 
Um, but looking at the last 10 years uh, f from fiscal year 2008 to 2019, you can see that despite the uh, legalization of different types of gambling activities, there hasn't been much growth in revenues. So the red line is for the um, subtotal gambling revenues. And every time I say revenue, to make it clear, it's the tax and fee revenues going to state and local governments. I'm not talking about the total revenues that uh, casinos generate. So you can see that uh, in 2008, fiscal year 2008, the total revenue was around $29 billion and it increased to $32.8 billion only. So it's not a lot of growth. The blue line is for the uh, casinos, uh, no, for lottery, the light blue line is for casinos and then the last two is for video games and perimutual. Um, well, let's take a look at uh, different sources of taxes for the states. I mean, as you know, states uh, generate revenue not only from gambling, but from personal income taxes, general sales taxes, corporate income tax, and motor fuel tax, among other tax sources. So when you compare the compound annual growth rate between 2009 and 2019, for the total sub uh, gambling, you can see that the compound annual growth rate was only 1.5% uh, over the 10 years period. Whereas for all other types of major types of gambling revi uh, uh, state revenues, state tax revenues, it was much, much higher. Personal income tax revenues increased for 3.5%. Um, general sales for 2.2%, corporate income tax also 2.2%, and motor fuel taxes for 1.6%. And the total taxes have grown by 2.5%. So in other words, there has been so much um, expansion of gambling activities, but that there hasn't been much growth, and the growth is much slower compared to all other types of tax growth. So let's take a look at the total uh, lottery timeline. Um, the blue states are the northeastern states, the red one south, and midwest and west are the green shaded, uh, the green dots. Uh, you can see that there is some kind of regional pattern um, starting from the northeast and moving to the midwest and the west, and, and then ending in the southern states being the latest adopter states for the lottery activities. So, um, next one. Um, states vary in lottery contributions to the state funds. Um, I mean, but in general, uh, on average, they contribute between uh, 25 and 30 percent, um, depending on the state. The outliers in here are Wyoming, South Dakota, and Oregon, which, and as well as Louisiana, kind of, which contribute much more compared to other states. Um, it's important to note that uh, revenues generated from lottery usually are earmarked, and they go either to general fund uh, or to education fund. And uh, what's um, crucial to know is that spending on education grows much faster than revenues generated from lottery. So in other words, uh, states um, that are relying on lottery revenues to fund education, they end up having much less revenues to fund the education over time. $591 billion. Can anyone take a guess what is this? The total amount of money spent on education. No. So I have tracked um, revenues generated from lottery operations since the inception for 56 years. Wow. That goes through 2019, sorry, I don't have the last three years. But 
in the 56 years, states have generated only $591 billion. And to give you an idea, states generate more than $1 trillion, almost three times more revenue in a single year in total. So despite <laughs> so much noise around lottery, the revenues are not so significant. So there is not much growth in lottery revenues despite expansion. And the following figure shows the lottery revenues over time in inflation adjusted terms. And the numbers in here on the top of the bar shows how many states had lottery operations in a single year. So you can see that revenues grow only when the new states come into the market. But once uh, there is not no new state coming to the market, when revenues stay, stay steady. So for example, uh, fiscal year 2016, uh, it, there is a growth just because there was a new state uh, coming to the market. And this figure shows year over year percent change in inflation adjusted uh, lottery revenues. Again, uh, the states mentioned are the states that have entered to the market in a given year. Uh, for example, um, Oklahoma entered in 2006. So you can see that each time there is a new state coming to the market, there is a growth. And when it goes down uh, around 19, late 90s, you can see that the revenues were down for lottery. And when South Carolina and a few other states came to the market, there was a jump and then again down. So what are the policy considerations for lottery, particularly that a lot of states are looking into online lottery options? Uh, well, they might be lucrative, but uh, it's important to note that uh, the literature review shows that those who engage, uh, who buy lottery tickets are usually poor people. And uh, that means that they do not really, or elderly people, which means that they do not necessarily have access to technological tools. So to make an argument that online lottery is gonna bring so much money is a mistake. And even the traditional lottery revenues are declining because um, the switch to using credit cards more often. So people, when they go to the convenience store, they do not have that single dollar to pay and uh, to pay for the lottery ticket. And uh, uh, most convenience stores do not accept credit card for $1 charges. So uh, that's one of the reasons why lottery revenues are going down as well. Um, so even though the lottery revenues have been the uh, biggest share of gaming revenue uh, pie, the growth has been very volatile and very weak. And so my advice is uh, to be aware that uh, they do not, lottery revenues do not keep up with uh, spending on education. Now let's take a look at the Xeno and Racino timeline. Uh, in here, you can see that the trend is actually going the opposite of the, uh, kind of opposite of the trend of the lottery because Northeastern states are more like late adopter states, whereas the South, uh, the Western and Midwestern states are the early adopter states. And again, in the red uh, is the Southern states in the, uh, $198 billion is uh, how much revenue states have generated in the last 41 years from casinos and casinos. Um, I look only for the last 41 years, um, meaning starting from 70s when uh, um, New Jersey came into the market being the second state because uh, unfortunately Nevada doesn't have historical data so I cannot go back to 1930s. But again, $198 billion is really nothing compared to um, all the other uh, types of tax revenues and it's, important to note that uh, on average total gambling revenues present no more uh, than 
2.5% of total state uh, general fund revenues. So despite uh, the expansion of casinos and casinos, there is not much growth in casino and casino revenues. It's, uh, the chart is similar to the lottery uh, chart where uh, I showed the um, inflation adjusted casino and casino revenues and the, bar, the numbers on the bars are the number of states that came to the market. So in 2019, the last year, there were 25 states in the market. And again, um, in here, you can see that there is really not much growth going on in casino and casino revenues. A similar chart showing <laughs> revenues uh, growing only when there is a new uh, state coming into the market. But what's uh, outstanding in here is that the over, if I had to put the linear trend line, you will see that it's a steep decline in, uh, in the growth. And you can see that even though the new states are coming into the market, where is really the overall trend is uh, downward. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, figures of all. It shows the cumulative percentage change in inflation-adjusted casino and uh, casino tax and fee revenues from the Great Recession until 2019. So. The blue line is uh, revenues for all casinos and casinos in the nation, whereas the red line is the same but excludes just four states, and those four states being Kansas, Maryland, Massachusetts, and, um, and Ohio. Why? Because all those four states started uh, casino and casino operations only after fiscal year 2008. So in other words, the red line shows the early adopter states. So just excluding the four states, you see that the cumulative percent change is in negative um, around 9%. So all that growth that you see in the blue one, which is um, less than 8% is because of uh, newly adopted uh, um, new states um, legalizing casino operations. Wow. And that tells again that there is a lot of substitution. States are copycats. When the neighboring states is opening a commercial casino, they are going to go and do the same. Um, as I have already mentioned, uh, states do not generate, uh, states um, casino and tax revenues uh, as share of state total tax revenues are not that significant, but they used to be relatively significant in six states, and both six states being Delaware, Indiana, Louisiana, Nevada, Rhode Island, and West Virginia, and each line is uh, representing the uh, respective states. So you can see that in, in fiscal year 2010, all of them in all those six states, uh, casino tax revenues as share of total state tax revenues was above 5%. But in all states, that share has declined steeply. And Nevada, which is home to more than 60% six, of commercial casinos in the nation, is the only state where uh, casino tax revenues represent uh, over 5% of the, of the total tax revenues. So in all other states, commercial casino revenues as share of total state tax revenues have declined steeply. Um, let's not take a look at some of the state regulations, how they attract, casino, uh, I guess, uh, gamblers, pat patrons. The yes and no are, some of the yeses are in red, some of the noes are in red, and the red color indicates a negative policy, of course. Uh, so uh, some uh, states uh, offer smoke-free, uh, um, 
um, and other states do not. So you can see that actually a lot of states uh, do, not, uh, do not ban smoking in casinos, which means that uh, it attracts, it um, tends to attract more gamblers. And Illinois, for example, was <laughs> one case when they used uh, not to have a, sm it used to be, um, so the smoking was, most, was not prohibited in Illinois, but once it was, the revenues went down dramatically. I do have uh, revenues for uh, Illinois separately. I didn't put it in here, but uh, you can see why states wouldn't want uh, to ban smoking in the casinos. And a lot of states also offered complimentary alcohol to bring in more gamblers and as well as um, a lot of states do not have statewide self-exclusion list. Um, so when looking at the casino and casino legalization, I think the public policy priorities should be determining factor for casino and casino expansions and the tax rates shouldn't be the determining factor for success. In fact, when you look at the tax rates for casinos, it's interesting because early adopter states have really low tax rates, as low as less than 0.25% in Colorado. Of course, in Colorado, it's graduated rate, but the lowest rate is 0.25%. And when you look at the late adopter states, they have much higher tax rates, as high as 67%. And the tax rates can be flat or graduated, as well as some states have tax rates that is uh, different for different um, facilities, New York being one of the examples. So I think states should account for all negative externalities when setting tax rates for casinos and VLTs, video lottery terminals. Um, and in, it is my belief that revenue shouldn't be earmarked for education or any other vital government services except for problem gambling because, um, as I mentioned already, the spending on education grows, uh, the growth rate, average growth rate is much higher for spending on education rather than for revenues generated from casinos. So, What's the latest in gambling? I mean, states always find a way to come up with new gambling activities or in general with new syntaxes. I mean, in the field of gambling, it's the betting on sports, sports betting, whereas in other types of syntax, it's, as you all know, the legalization of marijuana among the states. But um, it was in 2018 that the U.S. Supreme Court has opened the doors for sports gambling expansion. Prior to that, only four states had sports betting. Um, and of course, as I said, states are copycat. Currently, 33 states have uh, legalized the sports betting, have some kind of sports betting. And I wouldn't be surprised that in the next two, three, or even less than that uh, next year, where that number is going to grow more. Um, however, um, early data shows that the projections that states have been projecting to generate revenue from sports betting is much lower. Um, I mean, the actual revenues from sports betting are much lower than uh, the projections. In fact, um, around 2018, um, a London-based company, I forgot the name, has um, projected that um, if sports betting was legalized in the United States, then the US will generate a lot around 12 billion dollars. Uh, each year that number is much lower. The actual revenues from sports betting are already much, much lower than that projected 12 billion dollars. What's also important to know about sports betting, particularly about um, 
um, differences between the states is that the rules and regulations vary widely. Some states have online sports betting, whereas others do not. And um, in some states, all types of sports um, qualify for sports betting, whereas in other states, it's only specific sports. So once again, uh, it's important to know that um, the tax revenue potential from the sports betting is going to be volatile and it's not going to be huge, it's going to be small, so, um, and the tax rates shouldn't be a determining factor for uh, actual revenue trends. Um, the bottom line is that revenues from gambling are volatile. In fact, it was only in fiscal year 2008 during the Great Recession that uh, the number showed that revenues from gambling declined. So before that, the argument was always that gambling is a recession proof. But gambling was kind of recession proof because it was only in one or two states. Of course, in both states, in being Nevada or New Jersey, it was a recession proof. However, as new states came to the market, there was a substitution and competition, interstate competition for the same pool of gamblers. So when they realized that uh, gambling revenues are no longer recession proof, they are very volatile, they can deteriorate or even decrease over time, they are very small and they are not gonna fund your education budget. Um, for sure, gambling expansion brings in more revenue, but that's until a saturation point is reached and uh, some of the new revenue represents a shift rather than net growth. So, um, one thing that I forgot to mention about sports betting, and it's my personal belief, I do not have data to back up, but um, I mean, I know that the industry, gambling industry, wanted to uh, legalize sports betting because they thought that that way they are going to attract a younger generation to engage in the uh, uh, sports betting activities, which is kind of true, but I believe with the um, um, popularity of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, people are actually engaging in investing in cryptocurrency or Bitcoin, but it's also kind of like betting, right? Rather than sports betting. I mean, again, there is not much data or um, that's just my belief that because there is always a substitution of different kind of activities and um, because those two activities are kind of the same betting idea, I believe that people are engaged more in betting on cryptocurrency rather than sports betting. So the whole belief that sports betting is going <laughs> to bring in so much money is not really becoming the truth. Um, for more information, I have put together some links, uh, the links to my uh, latest uh, articles. The first one is looking into all sin taxes, not just gambling, including alcohol, uh, tobacco, and marijuana. And set revenues from gambling, short-term relief, long-term disappointment is one of the reports that has uh, attracted a lot of attention around the nation um, and we have hold a conference um, after release of this report and the recordings of the conference are in these YouTube links. I highly encourage you to look, uh, to watch the links. Um, we had uh, six, seven experts talking about um, uh, gambling impact on state revenues and I think you will find all uh, speakers very informative. And um, we also have different databases. Up until today there is really no single database except for our database looking at all different forms of gambling. Census Bureau has kind of category called, um, what is it called? Um, uh, amusement tax. But that includes different 
forms of taxes, not just gambling, including amusement parks, and it doesn't include all states. Um, and why is it important to look at other sources of taxes as well? Because I think as we are approaching to the next recession, um, more states will look into expansion of gambling activities. And a lot of states took advantage of the growing revenues in the last two years and cut taxes on income. And those income tax cuts are gonna create problems for the budgets in the coming year or two years. And when you have a budget problem and when you have an economic downturn, you cannot increase taxes on income or sales taxes. You are gonna go and inc uh, come up with a revenue source that is um, discretionary, so-called. So that being usually gambling or other forms of sin taxes. So um, I highly encourage to, to be more proactive rather than um, fight later. And this is the, also the case in New York City, which they are trying to open um, casinos in um, either in Broadway or um, in uh, Hudson Yard and um, in Times Square or in Hudson Yard. And now, you know, it's too late for the Broadway League to fight against it. And for sure, this is going to create um, a negative impact on um, entertainment industry on Broadway. And I hate seeing this, to be perfectly honest, because I love Broadway shows and I don't want Broadway shows to suffer because of the casinos coming into the New York City. They wanted to make New York City as the next Las Vegas, which is highly unlikely because New York City is known for Broadway shows, for museums, for art, for culture, whereas people go to Las Vegas just for gambling, not really much for anything else. I remember a few years ago when there was a debate whether they should open commercial casinos in New Hampshire, and I was invited to do a testimony, the argument was it's a good idea to open a casino next to the ski resort. People are going to go ski and calm down and um, just <laughs> go to the casino and just uh, be in the casino. And my argument was that uh, someone who is gonna ski is not gonna sit in front of the slot machine and be inactive and just <laughs> bet. So I hope, um, I hope this presentation provides a good background for all to be aware that revenues are not really a selling point, shouldn't be a selling point for expansion of the gambling. Questions. I just, I just, when I ever heard Lucy speak, I just learned so much. I thought it was just your insights onto the revenue from gambling, which is all this misery you heard about today. This is what you end up with. It's, it's, a, it's a loser. I just thought you did an outstanding presentation. So start with Adam 4K, please. Your, your data shows pretty conclusively that revenue is not going to increase no matter how many new products get added. Going all the way back to your first slide, what, what piece of that pie do you think is going to suffer most with the advent of online sports gambling? I think more lottery, it's not really casinos, but again, this is a new type of sports uh, gambling activity. And as I said, the, I have presented at the, for the industry as well. And I have been to the conferences present, organized by the gaming industry. And the whole argument a few years ago was that we wanted to engage a uh, young generation because those who are going to casinos are usually, or who are buying lottery tickets, you know, hardly ever see a young person going and buying a lottery ticket or going to, I mean, I know earlier today, I have seen young people committing suicide because of their addiction and it's heartbreaking, but that's not really your 
regular patron. I mean, normally it's elderly population. So they wanted to bring in new generation. But it's hard to say which uh, industry is gonna, which uh, form of gambling activity is gonna suffer, but. Uh, I, I know it was just an opinion. Yeah. <coughs> John Fruits. Um, hi, thank you for your work uh, today and, and the things you published, the really wonderful information that's gone out there. So thank you for that. Um, it looks like in your analysis today, you're, you're looking at government revenue from commercialized casinos. Um, where do the tribal casinos fit in that? They don't show up in your picture, but I know some of them are giving money to states in lieu of taxes and it's kind of weird arrangements. Do you have any measures of that? Yeah, um, I do have some information in uh, one of the reports on um, Indian casinos. Um, in the report, um, short-term relief, long-term disappointment. Unfortunately, Indian casinos are not required to release the data. But um, we know that the Indian casinos in Connecticut are the major contributor. Like most of the revenues for the nation from the Indian casinos comes from the Connecticut one. And of course, revenues have been going down as the neighboring states have been legalizing uh, commercial casinos. Um, uh, in general, they do not uh, generate that much revenue, but um, the information is in that report. And um, what two other things that is in that report, actually I showed the locations of the Indian casinos on the map as well as commercial casinos. Because when you look at the commercial casinos, it looks like that the Western states do not have any commercial casinos or not so much. But when you chart the Indian casinos, most of them are in the Western states. And the other interesting thing is the locations of the casinos are always at the borderline border being <laughs> so that they can have yeah have gamblers from the neighboring state so uh, to keep revenues of the neighboring residents in the state excellent lucy thank you so much